through the services this morning. Would you be with Tony as he brings the message to God? We just pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that they would come to know you today. We just pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Baptist Church. We trust that you feel right at church this morning. And we are honored that you have taken time to be here this morning. And if you are uh, visiting with us for the first time, or uh, maybe it's your second or third time, but you have not as of yet filled out a contact card, if you wouldn't mind doing that, we can have a record of your visit. Uh, that can be found attached to your bulletin. You can just tear that off and drop it in the offering plate at the end of the service. Or if there's, uh, if you're uh, not a visitor, uh, but whether you're a visitor or a regular attender and you have any uh, prayer request or anything with which we can help you, you can uh, put that information on that contact card as well and uh, put it in the offering plate at the end of the service likewise. And uh, I am being interrupted. Yes, you are. Because um, this is the announcement guy and the bulletin guy. And uh, I have an announcement he's unaware of. So, we don't uh, do that. Uh, <laughs> right here in the bulletin, if you have an announcement, please submit it in writing to the church office. You think you're the pastor around here or what? So, I just got a call yesterday, last night, night before, I forget, time run, runs together. But we have a special treat for you next week. If you've been here before, you know you'll enjoy it. If, you're, if you've not been here when this happened, then um, you'll really enjoy wanting to be here. Invite somebody to come with you. The Browers will be here next week. So uh, if you want to be here at Southern Gospel Group, if you don't know who the Browers are, Google it, and you'll enjoy the Browers. They are um, one of the country's premier Southern Gospel Groups. Do you have something to say, Ms. Pierce? Did you... I'm not going to be gone. I'll be here. So the Browders, next week, invite somebody to come with you. All right. So uh, put that on your schedule. Invite someone to come with you. If you would, please, let's stand together for our Bible reading this morning. And as uh, Brother Larry Harper comes to lead us in our Bible reading, we will dismiss Children's Church. Children's Church is through this back corner to your right. Just a few feet away at hallway number three, and we invite your children. There's a children's church program uh, really geared for children up through about third or fourth grade, and we uh, encourage you to take part in that if you would like to. Uh, if your children have not been before, you're, of course, welcome to go with them and, and see what's going on and see that they're comfortable. So we invite you to do that. All right, Brother Larry Harper is going to come and lead us in our Bible reading this morning, please, Brother Larry. It's my pleasure to read our Lord's Word to you this morning. We're in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, Wise and Foolish Virgins. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, uh, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God, our Father, we come to you this morning through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, asking for your blessing to this pastor who brings us this message this morning for all the works and endeavors that go into worshiping you as they culminate in this day's glory. Forgive us of our sins. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Ah, I've got a few warm. Right? Check it. So you got the flatted, right? And then affliction, right? I mean, this is the look you want. I think it will show off your eyes. I mean, it's got the sparkles, the bedazzles. Oh! You're clothed in radiant light. Okay, all right, you're gonna destroy my retinas. All right, hey, how about these? More fly like a bra? Again, the wings. Uh, my fast cars? You go with the speed of thought? I've got it up to 120. Well, you can take it to go see the jellyfish sandwich tonight. Two tickets, front row. I mean, I mean, they don't have a heart, but they're pretty good. Well, look, I work for the creator and designer of all music, of all sound for that matter. Of all matter for that matter. I mean, that's my new HD flash screen TV over there. Does it do anything for you? It's 3D. Yeah, so is the Milky Way. You're really a one-upper, you know that? Yeah, I'm living heaven with God. We got some pretty cool stuff up there. I mean, not that you'll ever see it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> until the door is shut and it won't be open again. A short amount of time until the Bible tells us here the parable of the ten virgins where there were ten virgins who were there and back in the New Testament day in the, the Middle Eastern culture a wedding could last up to three days. Thank the Lord that I don't live then. <laughs> You'd call and say, Brother Connie, you do my wedding, that'd be a no. I don't have three days to spare. Then it lasted up to three days, and it was this party that was divided into the father's house, the mother's house. The, there were the wedding party would, would group up and they'd get ready, and man, things would happen in a certain way. And Jesus gave this parable where he said there were these ten virgins and they were waiting 
for the event of the bridegroom to, to show up and they had their lamps and there were certain things that were done in certain orders. They had their lamps and they were trimmed and they were ready to go. But five of the virgins were foolish. By the way, it was a great place for these young women to pick up dudes. Just to kind of be seen. Right? To kind of mingle and kind of pick out who was appropriate suitors. So it was a great place for them to be. And five were foolish and didn't have enough oil when they heard the announcement that the bridegroom was coming and this whole bridal party was coming. The bridegroom and all these guys were coming. They woke up and realized they didn't have enough oil to light their lamps. And they said, hey, uh, let us, they told the other five, let us borrow from you. And they said, not so, lest we don't have enough. They said, go and buy. So they went to buy. And they, when they came back, uh, the door, the Bible says, was shut. So they knocked on the door. And Brother Elijah did this for me. This is the word closed in all these different languages, which I don't read. But they knocked on the door. And they said, hey, we're back. Let us in. And he said, I don't know who you are. We're not opening this door again. Party's going on. You should have been ready. That is some sobering words for you and I. There are a couple things this morning that we need to look at for our own sakes. Because again, we don't have all the time in the world. It's not because of death, just because of opportunity that slips by. There are four elements to shut doors that the Christian needs to consider. That all of us in this life need to consider. We want to look at those just by way of introduction. Four elements. First of all, the element of opportunity. The idea behind doors is that there are opportunities. We talk about the door of salvation, which is an opportunity for everyone, but people don't choose it. Uh, we talked about the opportunity of, uh, of excitement and, and enthusiasm in this life where Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open up, I'll come into you and, we'll, and I'll sup with you and I'll give you that enthusiasm and excitement about life. This door of opportunity. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, when the, then, the, then shall the kingdom of heaven, when it talks about uh, these, uh, these virgins who are waiting for the grooms and the bridegrooms and the wedding party to come, it says the kingdom of heaven is like the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Here's the opportunity. They know there's fixing to be this big wedding party. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. There's this whole kingdom of heaven. There's this whole unseen world that is available for you and I. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. If you, look, if you watch the uh, devotions that we do sometime on um, Monday mornings, that I do on Monday mornings, tune in tomorrow, I'll talk to you about my invisible friend. My invisible friend, the Bible says Moses was able to do what he did in faith because he was able to see him who was invisible. First Timothy says, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Until you're able to see that which is unseen clearly and invest in that, you're always going to miss it. There's this opportunity. All of us have it. What are you going to do with the opportunity. Many people will experience the shut door that will never be open because they don't see the Christian life as an opportunity. They see the Christian life as a, as a doldrum, as a, as, a, uh, as a responsibility that is one that, that is not really an opportunity. It's just one that I have to. Like, kind of like your kids see eating their vegetables or going to the dentist. They don't see the benefits in it. They just see, oh, I've got to go to the dentist. But it's important. They don't see the joys of the Christian life. In every shut door, you see the door of opportunity. Do you see the door of opportunity in the Christian life? You see the door also of obligation. In the doors of opportunity in the Christian life, there's not just opportunity. There's also obligation. So in the Christian life, you say, yes, but Tony, I see how important the Christian life is. I see how awesome the Christian life is. Well, in conjunction with that, you cannot have the opportunity unless you accept the obligation. In going through these doors with the Lord, there are certain obligations that you cannot get around. Here the Bible says that these five were wise and five were foolish. Five understood that with 
the relationship that we have with the Lord. There are these obligations that come with it. Tonight we'll begin a study on holiness, not a word that we hear very often. But do you realize that God will not even hear the prayer of people who have sin in their life, they know it's in their life, and they absolutely refuse to handle it? Not in our society, we say, oh, God hears everybody. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. If I refuse to handle sin in my life, if I refuse to be that person which God calls me to be, then I cannot have that relationship with Him. He will not function and work in my life like I wanted to. I have the opportunity, but have I accepted the obligation? The five foolish understood what they were there to do, and yet they refused to bring oil. Many Christians act the same way in their life. They say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, and they do not follow through with Christian obligation. One time we had a sign by the road that said, um, uh, visitors welcome, members expected. I bet I had three or four people say, you shouldn't expect anything of us. I thought to myself, that is a weird thing to say. It's a weird thing for a Christian to say. God shouldn't expect anything of me. I'm like, that's a great way for him not to be disappointed, I am sure. <laughs> Do you expect anything? Uh, have you seen the, 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 the uh, uh, commercial of uh, the security monitor? Some insurance commercial? I'm not a security guard. I'm a security monitor. I'm just here to tell you if you're being robbed. You're being robbed. <laughs> what? I need some help, right? You have certain expectations in your life of Christians when you step through that door. We'll talk about those obligations, the wise and the foolish. Also, we see options. Every time you have obligations, you have options. God is so loving that he gives you the opportunity not to choose him. Because you can only really love somebody if you have the option not to. One of the things I love so much about my wife is that I didn't have to knock her in the head and drag her to my cave. She came willingly. The idea here of options, the Bible says in verse number three, and they that were foolish took their lamp, but they took no oil. And I got to thinking, why would you take your lamp and not take oil? I think the same reason that we don't fully live for Christ. Why don't we fully live for Christ? Well, it may have been too inconvenient. Carrying extra oil, where would I carry it? It may be heavy. It may be cumbersome. Maybe it was too expensive. How much is it going to cost? What am I going to have to not carry? What am I going to have to not have if I go and buy extra oil? Maybe it's too cumbersome. Maybe it's too inconvenient. Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe it's too uh, uncomfortable. Right? I'm going to have to tote it. Maybe they were just too busy. They had other stuff going on in their lives and they didn't have time to go and buy the extra oil needed. Either way, the result was this. The outcome is either you're on one side of that door or the other when it's locked shut. There are three areas I want to talk to you about doors that are going to be ultimately one day shut in your life and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. And one day, you're either going to be on one side or the other. You're going to say, I did this or I did not do it. I wish I would have or I'm glad I did. And every person will be on one side or the other of that door. The first for Christians is this door of service. In Deuteronomy chapter number 1, and we won't go into great detail reading it, but in Deuteronomy chapter number 1, and verse number 21, you see when the children of Israel first went to the land of promise, this land where God, it gives them the opportunity in verse number 21, and says, take the land that I promised you, this land flowing with milk and honey. Then you see the obligation. Now go in and possess it. Now you've got to go and fight. But the people had options and they said, we will not go in. We're scared. The people are huge. And the result was rebellion. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We're scared we won't win. We talked about the door of fear. 
The outcome was God says, okay, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until everybody that's a certain age is dead and your children will come back and take it like I promised. And then they said, no, we changed our mind. We will go in and fight. And God says, don't do it. They're like, we're doing it. God says, don't do it. I'm not going with you. Verse number 41 and 42, you can read it for yourself. Don't do it. They go in and are destroyed and go back out into the wilderness where they one at a time die for their rebellion. Why? Because the door of opportunity, the door to serve the Lord, the door to go into the land of promise, this victorious Christian life was shut. Do not buy the lie that it's never too late. Don't buy that lie. Today is the day. Right now is the time. He was going to be all that a man could be tomorrow. No one would be kinder or gentler than he tomorrow. A friend who was troubled and wearied, he knew, who'd be glad of the lift and who needed it too. On him he would call and see what he could do tomorrow. Each morning he stacked up the letters he'd write tomorrow. He thought of the friends he would fill with the light tomorrow. It was too bad he was busy today and hadn't a minute to stop on the way. More time he would have to give others, he'd say, tomorrow. The greatest of workers this man would have been tomorrow. The world would have known him if only he'd seen tomorrow. But the fact is, he died and faded from view. And all that was left when his living was through was a great stack of things. Almost did it. He intended to do tomorrow. People always say, Brother Tony, you always get so close. How do you not step off? Almost did it right there. <laughs> the world would have known him if only he'd seen tomorrow. But the fact is, he died and faded from view. And all that was left when his living was through was a great stack of things he intended to do tomorrow. So you keep on ignoring it, keep on ignoring God's call, and one day you'll knock on that door and say, Lord, I changed my mind. And he'll say, who are you? Lord, I'm going to do it today. No, you're not. You see, God doesn't have to have us. God has used all kinds of people. By, he claimed to be able to use the rocks. He did, in fact, one day use somebody's donkey. Which gives me comfort. Because I know if he can use a donkey that somehow he can use me. But guys, you and I need to know that the time is now. Because one day the door will be shut. The door of service. You won't always have the ability to tell somebody. They'll not always be here. You'll not always have the time and ability to do what you're able to do right now. Today is the day. Things that need to be handled, sin. Sin needs to be handled, needs to be handled right now. Brother Tony, I have this in my life, and I know I need to handle it, but there's not a but. Listen to this door of sin. Genesis chapter number 9, or 6 and verse number 9. We're familiar with a guy who lived in a wicked generation. The man's name was Noah. Noah lived in a generation who the Bible says he was perfect and upright, not perfect like he had never made any mistakes, but he was perfect as in he was mature and he trusted God with his life in a wicked generation. By the way, let me say this. You and I are in a great place in this world because it is so easy to be light when things are so dark. You got excited me. I mean, lines in our society are clear. I had somebody over the house one time. I said, hey, let's do something. Let's, uh, let's turn the TV on, and let's turn it every time something that doesn't honor God comes on. Ready to go. It didn't take us no time. Almost got carpal tunnel. Anybody tried to watch Family Feud lately? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, family? You're going 
get me you, Steve Harvey. <laughs> you can't think of one question without sexual content. Ooh. I'm flipping through. Why? It's amazing. Those things that we know, it's not ambiguous. There's no question. We know in our life those things that don't honor God. Here's Noah. He lives in a, in a place and he takes the opportunity. You and I have this opportunity to live for God and have a life that honors him. And I know it's difficult to do. I'm thinking about doing something for our teenagers and for any adults who would like to. And I'm thinking about ordaining anyone who would like to be ordained. Never heard of a church doing it before. Do you want to be ordained? I'll ordain you. Here's all it takes. You got to be willing to do a couple things. All you have to do is be willing to be a missionary where you are. You've got to be willing to commit yourself to stay close to the Lord in prayer and His Word and seeking Him. Not hard so far. You can do that. I won't ask you to reply. Because it's fixing it more difficult. And then when you go out into the world, say in your workplace. If you go out in the workplace, you have to be willing to be alive for him. And here's how you would have to do it. Or at school. So when you go into a group and they're speaking of things that are not appropriate, not God-honoring, they're telling dirty jokes, then you just dismiss yourself from that group. You don't have to make a big deal about it. You don't have to scream Jesus' name. You just have to say, hey, go do something. And when they're watching stuff or looking at stuff that they shouldn't be looking at, 77% of men have looked at pornography this week. Almost 20% of women this week. Do you have to be willing to say, no, not involved? When they do things that you know are not God honored, when they go out to the truck after work and break out the alcohol, you know. When they invite you to the bar, you know. You just have to be willing to say, I'm not going to be a part. Then when you get a chance, you have to be willing to point them to Christ in some simple way. This is what I love about my Christian life. This I think would help you. And you can be ordained to wherever you are in this world. When they curse, you don't curse. Simple stuff that the Bible says do. We can't do anymore. Why? Because we are consumed by it. Noah was a guy that when he was at the restaurant, people knew who he was. There's Noah. Old Bible bumping Noah. He thinks God's going to make this big difference in his life. Old Noah. Yep. Why? He just had the opportunity. He said, I'm just going to stay close to the Lord. The Bible says he was upright in his generation. There was an obligation, though. You know what the obligation was? Look at verse number, chapter number 7, verse number 5. Here's what it says. And Noah did according unto, are you sitting down? All. Because here's what we like to do. We like to do what we like to do, but then there's just that little bit that we like to hold on to. Not Noah. Noah. Noah said, I like to do all. All of it. <coughs> If you don't look like Jesus, I like to let it go. Sins and weights. Give him a mule kick. If it's a sin, I'm getting rid of it. If it's a weight, I'm getting rid of it. If I can't share Jesus with you while I do it, I can't do it. It's got to glorify God in my life. Why? Well, he says, he did all the Lord commanded him to do. But there are options. What were the options? The rest of the people, every imagination thought of their heart were evil continually because that's where we end up going. Because sin is a monster of awful means. The behavior is only to be seen, seen to all face to face, first to be tolerated, then endured, then embraced. You thought you had it, now it has you. Brother John, I like my freedom. Sin ain't the right way to have freedom, bro. I promise. I've talked to multiple people last week. I'm telling you, with God is my witness. I've talked to people last week, Brother John, I don't know what to do. I know you don't know what to do because it got you. That sin got you, and you don't know how to get rid of it. You don't know how to shuck it. My son would grab me from the laundry room when I come home from work when he was little, and he'd say, I got you. I'm like, you don't got me. I got you.
guy too. Didn't even have to come and look for you. Ain't that how it goes? You think you got the casino? You ain't got the casino. They gave me a free night. They didn't give you nothing. They, they paid you to give you give them their your check. <laughs> Which is fine, but I'm just telling you, man, I don't make no sense. Oh boy told me, so I, I knew I had to go, and my wife said, I need some more money, I'm winning. Yeah, you winning? False positives all over this world. That's what happens. Everything. There are options to that. But let me tell you the problem with this whole scenario. 100 years Noah spent building this ark, and the Bible says, and they went in, every male and female, the outcome of this was this. Every male and female of all flesh was outside of this ark, and God commanded them, as God commanded Noah to go in, and the Lord, here's what the Lord did, the Lord <coughs> shut the door. Noah did not shut the door of the ark. It was not his business. You, by the way, don't shut the door on other people. We give people room to grow. It's not our place to stand in judgment to them as far as where they're going to end up, how they're going to end up. It's our place to love and accept and hope, faith, grow in Christ. However, one day, understand this, that sin will slam the door on you. How many people do you think in that day when the rain began to fall, the water began to rise, was knocking on that door and slamming on that door, and they realized they were in a bind because of sin, and it's too late, the door shut. No one didn't shut it, he couldn't open it. How many of you have been there? Sin. When the door shut, the door shut. And I wish it was different, it's just not. Nobody in this room has sin in their life. Nobody. Sin has you. That's how that goes. Every time. Have you seen the guy with the pet tiger? I mean the pet lion? And he had the kids over to the house playing with it. And some kid on one end stepped on the tail and the kid on the other end paid the price. The lion grabs this kid, he's chucking this kid around, tearing this kid's arm off. Everybody's like, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You got a lion in your backyard. <laughs> Ignoramus. You don't have a pet lion. You have a man eater. <laughs> Dipstick. <laughs> don't be shocked and awe when the crocodile hunter dies. He's a crocodile hunter. We're moving on. <laughs> Last of salvation. Don't miss this. Please. In this life, <coughs> salvation is the same thing. We have the opportunity. You and I have the opportunity, and this is really what it is. We have the opportunity to know, to know personally the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of Heaven. God sent His Son in human form so that we could know Him. We killed Him. He died for our sins. Day after day, we try to repeat the process. We try to kill him and move him out of our lives, out of our way. Try to ignore the fact that he wants to have this personal relationship with us. Man, what a privilege. What an opportunity you and I have to know God. Not to know church. We talked about it in church membership class. Guys, listen. Forget trying to know a denomination or a religion or a person who's a, some kind of dynamic speaker. Do you know God? I had a guy two weeks ago who was telling me all about this stuff he knew about the Bible. And I said, man, do you know Jesus? Well, yeah, I know Jesus. Don't be dismissive about it. Do you know Jesus? What's he like? What's it like to know God in your life, to really have God as the motivating person in your life? To where when you need something, you can go to him. I have a toilet at my house that isn't working right. Everybody, I wish everybody could see what I see. Because everybody here is like, so. <laughs> I've told in my life, my, my house that's not working right, my wife came to me. I said, Jill, toilet ain't working right. You know why? She was looking for answers. I'm telling you, in my life, I'm at the place in my life 
and I wish I could just, just pull it out of my pocket and hand it to you in a, in a physical form. But I'm at the place in my life when things aren't what they need to be. I can really go to a real God and say, Lord, this is what's going on in my life. You and I have this opportunity through salvation to really have these real answers in any situation in our life. When we are at the place as far as being what God wants us to be after salvation. And, and he ha we're having that real relationship with him. We have that, that, that opportunity. The problem is this. After salvation, we think, well, I have a relationship with God. Because you have salvation and you just stopped it. You forgot that with salvation comes obligations. Imagine if my wife and I had, were on the outs. And we were fighting, which, by the way, uh, last week somebody asked about if we were divorced. I said, I don't think so. I'll ask her. <laughs> so, no, if you've heard the rumor. Um, no, not even arguing that I'm aware of. If we are, she's arguing by herself. <laughs> but let's assume that we were on the outs with one another. Do you think that she would then come and say, uh, hey, uh, the uh, toilet's messed up? I'm like, I don't care. What if she just had an affair? Then she came and said, hey, Tony, the toilet's messed up. Well, go ask whoever you have an affair with. Go ask whoever's sitting on it. I don't care. We're not even living together. But that's how we act with the Lord, isn't it? We try to come to Him in salvation, and then we're out living with the world, and then we come to Him. Lord, I have these problems. Do you? It's interesting. Go and ask the gods. Read the book of Ezekiel. Go and ask the gods that you made with your own hands. Go ask the gods you carved out. Go ask the gods that you're serving. We have these obligations. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse number 23, Then one came to the Lord and said, Lord, are there few be that be saved? It should shake us to our core that there are only few that be saved. He said, are there few that be saved? Yeah, but there are some that can be saved. You can be saved. But the obligation is this, enter into that gate. We talked about that door, that everybody has to enter in, but it's the only door of salvation. You can't go into another door. That's the obligation. You have to go through Him. You have to come to Him and through Him and be in Him. That's the obligation. But people have other options. It's amazing how people choose other options outside of Christ. The Bible says this, Strive to enter into the straight gate, for many, I say, of you will uh, seek to enter in, but shall not. They'll look at it and they'll be like, oh, I'm not going to do that. You know, one of the cool things, when I was in the youth group, the teenagers would be out at the water fountain or something, and, um, and I'd go in there and I would take a teenager's head, and I would mash his head toward the water. You know, you can almost drown a teenager in a water fountain, because they're not very smart teenagers. Aren't they? The, the brain doesn't begin to develop doesn't really begin to jail until about 25 years old. And you can hold their head in the water. And they'll go, <laughs> and, I'll say, and I would say, let go of the handle. <laughs> and they wouldn't do it. They panic. I said, let go of the handle. <laughs> let go. That, I mean, you have to take your hand and let off the handle. Like, you're doing this to yourself. That's how so many people in this world do it. They're living in this world. They're, they're in this world. And they are literally drowning. You're like, hey, bro. The door of salvation. Let go of the handle, man. You're, going, you're drowning yourself. You're trying to save yourself. You're trying to do things for yourself. It's not going to work. Because you have all these options. You choose the wrong outcome. And here's what the Bible says about it. And then... Um, they says they'll, they'll not enter into that straight gate. And when uh, once the master of the house, here, here it is, this is how we're going to finish. When once the master of the house has risen up and hath shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and knock on the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer unto you, I know not whence ye are. Then shall they begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in our presence. We've talked in our streets. And he'll say, I never knew you. I don't know you. I don't know you. 
The door is shut. The opportunity you had, you had. When are you going to act? And what makes you think you would act differently tomorrow? But Tony, I'm going I'm to think about it and, and we'll talk. Revelation says this in the last book of the Bible. Then he saith unto me, seal not up the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Because why? They still have time. But the time is at hand. And he said, that, and, and he that is just, here's what it says. He that is just, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. There's the opportunity. And I give every man according to his work. And that's how it will be. If he chose me, that's how it is. But he that is just will be just, and he that is righteous will be righteous. As the musicians come, someone wrote, The Spirit came in childhood and pleaded, Let me in. But oh, the door was bolted by thoughtlessness and sin. I am too young, the child replied. I will not yield today. There's time enough tomorrow. And the Spirit went away. Again he came and pleaded in youth's bright, happy hour. He came but heard no answer. For lured by Satan's power, the youth lay dreaming. Then he said, not today. Not till I've tried earth's pleasures. And the spirit went away. Again he called in mercy, in, man, in manhood's glorious prime. But still he found no welcome. The merchant had no time. No time for true repentance. No time to think or pray. He sowed and sowed, repulsed and saddened, the spirit went away. Once more, he called and waited. Man was now old and ill, and scarcely heard the whisper, and heart and cold and still. Go leave me when I need thee. I'll call for thee, he cried, and sinking on his pillow, Without any hope, he died. That, I'm afraid, is how many people will end their life. You know, I thought about it when I was a kid, and I just was just, you know, I was too young. And when I was a teenager, I've had parents say, well, you know, they got to sow their wild oats. Oh, boy, that'll make me ground my teeth. You know what you get when you sow wild oats? Wild oats. Then young men are too busy trying to make their lives what it needs to be, and middle-aged people are too busy trying to get established, and old people are too set in their ways. And I'm just telling you, today is the day. I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute. But eternity is in. One day you'll turn around and the door will be closed. It'll be locked and you can knock all you want. It'll be too late. It's my complete belief that everybody in this room has time today. You got time. But it will not always be like that. What are you going to do about salvation? What are you going to do about sin? What are you going to do about serving and doing what God wants you to do with your life? It's really up to you. As somebody goes back and gets the candidate for baptism, let's stand together. The altar is open. I'm not asking you. Make a decision for me. I'm just telling you the time is getting short every day of my life. It's one more day closer to me. So we pray together. As the musicians sing, this is your one more opportunity. He was pierced for